You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Hello, and welcome to episode 316 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Early America was really a disease-ridden time and place. As you heard earlier this year, in episodes 301 and 302, smallpox was one of the deadliest diseases that early Americans came into contact with. The other deadliest disease that early Americans faced was yellow fever. Now, while conducting research for our episodes about smallpox and the history of inoculation and vaccination, my colleague Holly White found the work of historian Catherine Oliveris, which investigates yellow fever epidemics in early New Orleans and how early New Orleanians often used immunity to yellow fever as a marker of a human's value and worth to New Orleans society. That means that both whites and blacks, free and enslaved, were often measured and accepted into New Orleans society based on whether they had immunity to yellow fever. As with most research that we conduct for special episodes, the history that Holly found was really fascinating. We didn't have space to dive into yellow fever and immunity in episodes about smallpox, inoculation, and vaccination. So Holly hung on to this idea, and over the fall, she created this episode all about yellow fever, immunity, and early New Orleans. Now I'm going to let Holly take it from here, but before I go, please be advised that Holly and her guest are going to be discussing the symptoms and progress of yellow fever. Yellow fever is a really nasty disease, and its symptoms are pretty horrid. So if you're eating, have kids in the car with you, or you have a bit of a queasy stomach, please be advised of what's ahead. But first, here's some exciting news from the Omohundro Institute. Hi, I'm Rob Parkinson, Associate Professor of History at Binghamton University. And my new book, 13 Clocks, How Race United the Colonies and Made the Declaration of Independence, published by the Omohundro Institute, is out now. This book covers the 15 months between Lexington and Concord and the Declaration of Independence. And we think we know that story cold, especially in 1776. It is a straight march from Thomas Paine and common sense through Thomas Jefferson denouncing the king in the Declaration of Independence. What I have found is we have forgotten so much of what happens in those 15 months and especially about the presence of African Americans and Native Americans in that story, and then worries and opportunities about how we can exploit these fears and use that as a basis for this extremely fragile thing of unity. Get your copy of 13 Clocks, How Race United the Colonies and Made the Declaration of Independence wherever you buy your books. And if you'd like more information about Rob's book, 13 Clocks, and where you can purchase a copy, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash clocks. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash clocks. In 1803, the United States purchased the Louisiana Territory from France. This purchase included the vital port city of New Orleans. But the United States did not just acquire the city's land, peoples, and wealth. The American government also inherited the city's yellow fever problem. In early America, yellow fever had a mortality rate of 50%. Those who made it through the vicious virus were rewarded with a lifetime of immunity. But in a time when yellow fever vaccinations and blood tests to prove antibodies were not in existence, how did early Americans make sense of immunity? And how did they distinguish between those who were immune? and those still at risk of catching the virus. Our guest, Catherine Oliveris, an assistant professor of history at Stanford University, leads us on an exploration of yellow fever and the significance of perceived immunity in early New Orleans. During our discussion, Catherine reveals what epidemic yellow fever was and how it spread in early America, how early New Orleanians used yellow fever and ideas about immunity to create a harsher system of racialized and class-based inequality and what the history of disease can tell us about early American history. Our guest is an assistant professor of history at Stanford University. 
She's a historian of the Antebellum South, the Greater Caribbean, and disease. Her forthcoming book, Necropolis, Disease, Power, and Capitalism in the Cotton Kingdom, tells a story of yellow fever, immunity, and inequality in early New Orleans. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Catherine Oliveris. Thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. Catherine, your research explores how early Americans constructed ideas about immunity and privilege in early New Orleans. It also deals with yellow fever. Would you tell us about the disease yellow fever? In the 19th century and before, yellow fever killed as many as half of the people that it infected. Yellow fever tended to kill young adults, especially those people between the ages of 15 and 40, rather than the very young or very old. The other half, the surviving half, became what people in the Atlantic world called acclimated or creolized or seasoned. That is, they became immune for life. Yellow fever was an utterly petrifying disease because it was shrouded in mystery. There was no cure, no inoculation, no conclusive evidence of disease transmission, no consensus as to whether it was contagious, and no satisfactory explanation for why it killed some and spared others. Everyone agreed that it was a very horrible way to die. Victims experienced a sudden onset of intense headaches, muscle pains, jaundice, nausea, and chills. Within days, delirium set in, victims seeped blood through their external orifices, they wept tears of blood, and they vomited up partly coagulated blood that was roughly the color and consistency of coffee grounds. So this was the signature symptom of yellow fever, this dreaded black vomit. As victims' livers and other organs shut down, patients turned bright yellow, banana yellow, they lapsed into a coma, and then they died. And this could all happen over a couple of weeks, and in some people it happened in just a few days. So how does this disease transmit to humans and how does it become epidemic? Most of the time, the yellow fever virus sits dormant in the bloodstream of monkeys living very high in jungle or forest canopies. But sometimes a mosquito will take a blood meal from an infected primate, then fly a short distance, then bite a human. If that infected person travels into a warm or densely populated area with lots of these Aedes aegypti mosquitoes and lots of susceptible people, so that is non immune or unvaccinated people, the disease can spread very quickly and very violently. Epidemic yellow fever in a non endemic zone requires a kind of trifecta of conditions to emerge. So you need a hot and humid climate, a large and densely packed human population of non immunes, and a robust vector population. Yellow fever has struck cities in the subtropics like Buenos Aires or Charleston or New Orleans. So these are places that are hot enough in the summer months to sustain the mosquitoes' feeding and breeding activity and where ships from warmer climates constantly reinforced the vector population of those mosquitoes. Most often, yellow fever struck the coastal lowlands of the greater Caribbean, so especially the port cities of equatorial West Africa, South America, and the West Indies, where mosquitoes lived and bred year-round. It is not native to the United States or to the Americas, but rather to parts of West and Central Africa. If yellow fever originated in Africa, how and when did the disease make its way to the Americas? When was the first recorded yellow fever epidemic in North America? So this is a really great and big question and one that historians have actually grappled with for some time. And the answer is actually that we'll never really know with 100 percent certainty. I guess our best guess is that the virus, like the Aedes aegypti mosquito, probably came to the Americas in the era of the transatlantic slave trade. These bugs, essentially, these mosquitoes, stowed away with captives below deck on these transatlantic voyages. These mosquitoes sat on the walls of the ship, they occasionally fed on captives' blood, and they laid their larvae in one of the dozens of freshwater casks that each of these ships carried. And so second or third generation bugs then disembarked in the Americas 60 days later or so. These bugs started coming to the Americas following 1492 and the first transatlantic slave ship voyages. But the sugar revolution of the mid-17th century really changed everything. Sugarcane, as many people probably know, is not actually native to the Caribbean. European colonists found that the grass grew very well there due to sustained heat and fertile soil. Cultivating sugarcane, this is backbreaking labor on a time crunch. With so much work to be done, with so much money to be made, this sugar plantation complex essentially ascended. We see this massive explosion in sugar plantations across the Caribbean that were worked by hundreds and thousands of enslaved Africans. And we see the population of the Caribbean just shoot up 
So for example, 1629, Barbados had about 1,400 people, but 15 years later, it had 40,000 people. And we see this sort of upsurge in population mirrored across the Atlantic as each of these islands adopts sugar cultivation. So sugar meant more enslaved Africans. Enslaved Africans meant more slave ships, and slave ships meant more Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. And these bugs really thrived in the tropics. By the mid-17th century, the Caribbean had unwittingly put itself on the precipice of a disease disaster. Yellow fever's first recorded epidemic in North America struck between 1647 and 1651. And at the time, nobody recognized this disease. This was a disease that nobody had ever seen before. People were entirely unfamiliar with it. But they did see that it killed a lot, a lot of people. It killed over 6,000 people in Barbados alone. That's 14% of the island's population. And we see sort of recurrent epidemics striking every few years around the entire sort of Atlantic basin. In episodes 301 and 302, we explored the development of inoculation and vaccination for another epidemic disease, smallpox. As you mentioned, yellow fever's signature signs were yellowing of the skin and the dreaded black vomit. Smallpox's giveaway sign was the pustules that formed all over a person's body. How might we compare a yellow fever epidemic to a smallpox epidemic? Smallpox was the other most terrifying disease in the Atlantic world. And in the past, it killed about three in 10 people that it infected. Europeans also brought smallpox to the Americas, a disease that was responsible for much of the depopulation of the Americas following 1492. But a smallpox epidemic was somewhat different than a yellow fever epidemic in some sort of crucial ways. So the first one is that smallpox was mainly spread by direct and fairly prolonged face-to-face contact between people. It can spread through the air and through touch, but it can also spread through fomites. So objects can be contaminated by this virus, like bedding, for example, or clothes. Humans also figured out ways to inoculate against smallpox much, much earlier than yellow fever. Of course, there's the famous story of Edward Jenner noticing that milkmaids did not get smallpox, but instead cowpox and using fluids from their pustules to inoculate against smallpox. And I guess the other major difference, too, is that smallpox can be spread by humans only. Scientists have no evidence that smallpox can be spread by insects or animals, whereas yellow fever is certainly spread by mosquitoes. While early Americans may not have fully understood how disease was spread, they did seem to know that they could do something to slow the spread. What were some of the preventative measures that early Americans used in attempts to mitigate the spread of diseases? There were various preventative measures that people did use to guard against all manner of different diseases. Probably the biggest one early on is quarantine. This is where incoming ships that are originating from ports where there are outbreaks, that they are quarantined in ports and they're sort of inspected and checked. You know, this is actually very effective against yellow fever when properly implemented. That when properly implemented part is actually the key part to emphasize here, because very often they were not properly implemented and sort of ships would get through and mosquitoes would fly to shore and thus create another outbreak of yellow fever. Quarantine is a big one, but also various sort of cities and towns and locales used sanitation. So quite literally cleaning streets, draining streets, flushing streets, trying to remove garbage and sewage places that have this fetid smell, they try to sort of quite literally sweeten the air. That was seen as best prevention against many, many diseases, you know, until the 20th century. An effective vaccine for yellow fever was not invented until the 1930s, and it was developed in Cuba. Catherine, did early Americans ever attempt to inoculate themselves against yellow fever the way they did with smallpox? There was no inoculation to yellow fever, and doctors essentially recognized this. But many people did actually try to contract this illness. I've seen examples of jumping into their recently dead friends' beds, rolling around, quite literally eating black vomit, putting it in their mouth, seeing if this will, you know, sort of give them a milder case, perhaps, or at least bring the disease on so they can survive it. I've seen examples of doctors injecting the blood of yellow fever victims into their own veins, seeking to understand how this disease spreads and why it spreads. But there was no way to prevent yellow fever, ironically, except for getting yellow fever and surviving it and gaining immunity. If early Americans could not inoculate themselves to prevent contracting yellow fever, what did they do once they contracted it? How did early Americans treat or cure yellow fever in the past? Then, as now, in fact, there was no cure. There is no cure for yellow fever. Now, in the past, in the antebellum South in general, but especially in New Orleans, there were all manner of sort of self-styled fever experts. 
people who claim to have the cure, people who claim to have an excellent record that, you know, they never had a patient who died from yellow fever under their care. But it's totally untrue. But you see a sort of two different camps emerge in New Orleans and in many places. So the first camp was sort of the French approach. This was generally done by French doctors, those who had been trained in Paris or with armies and navies conducting military campaigns in the Atlantic world. And French doctors, their approach was more passive. So bed rest, maybe some emetics, maybe some medicine, which is mostly just means to keep the fever down as much as possible. But mostly French doctors argued for passivity in treating patients. American doctors in New Orleans were known for their heroic so-called approaches. So they would blister patients. They would bleed them very heavily. In fact, they would treat them also with mercury which, of course, can be very dangerous because mercury is also poisonous and can kill you if you take too much of it. But fundamentally, the best bet for people in the past was to keep the fever down and stay hydrated, stay comfortable. You know, whether these interventions actually worked, these medicines, so-called, is another question entirely. There still is no cure to yellow fever today, which is why actually the vaccine is so incredibly important. In fact, probably this is how many Americans and many people around the world are familiar with vaccine passports, because you have a little yellow card in your passport that says you have been vaccinated to yellow fever if you're traveling to places where it's endemic. Your forthcoming book, Necropolis, investigates how early Americans constructed ideas about immunity and privilege in early New Orleans. Could you tell us briefly about the history of early New Orleans and its early experiences with yellow fever? The French founded New Orleans in 1718, and then it was taken over by the Spanish following the settlement of the French and Indian War in 1763. And then it actually went back to French control in 1802. And then the U.S. acquired Louisiana in 1803 following the Louisiana Purchase. Until the 1790s, most European empires considered New Orleans really a supply depot rather than a sort of independent lucrative colony in its own right. So this was a place from which the Caribbean would be provisioned. It sat on a large swampy river bend about 30 leagues from the Gulf of Mexico. And though the fort immediately fronted a 15-foot levee, so the levee is this sort of natural dirt and silt barrier at the river's edge, most of town sat a very precarious one foot above sea level. I guess you could say that the main ecological limitation of New Orleans has always been overwhelming amounts of water from seemingly everywhere, from the ground, from the sea, from the river, from the sky. Basically, all colonists in the 18th century complained that tobacco, which was going to be the stable crop of New Orleans, that was the sort of intended crop, that tobacco rotted in the ground before it matured. And they all complained about the mosquitoes, just swarms and swarms of mosquitoes, and that, you know, their floorboards are rotting out every couple of years, and that if they leave a pair of leather boots outside, it would be covered in just a thick layer of mildew by the morning. So starting in the 1790s, we see just plantation after plantation spring up along the lower Mississippi River these very, very lucrative cotton and even more lucrative sugar plantations, of course, worked by enslaved Africans and their descendants that are making people incredibly, incredibly wealthy. We see this agricultural boom happen in cotton and sugar. And at the same time, we're seeing tons and tons of people coming to Louisiana, hoping to get in on the ground floor of this agricultural boom. So these are sort of ambitious white people from Europe and from the northern United States. And of course, we're seeing thousands upon thousands of enslaved Africans also arriving in Louisiana to grow cotton and sugar. So it's probably no accident that we also see around the same time an upsurge in diseases, and particularly yellow fever. So we see New Orleans' first indisputable yellow fever epidemic striking in about mid-July 1796. And this was an epidemic so deadly and unprecedented that New Orleanians still spoke about it decades and decades later. Thousands of people died. We see a couple patterns develop during this epidemic. So the first big one is that rich people could flee. We see this with a lot of epidemics, but rich people basically just packed up their bags and they headed out of town, trying to put distance between themselves and this diseased city. But of course, that meant that poor people, enslaved people who had you know neither the freedom nor the funds to leave necessarily, had no choice but to remain in this city. Many people spent all the money they could on you know what they saw as preventative cures like vinegar or quinine. But for the most part, as we talked about, those were pretty ineffective cures. By the epidemic's end, in November, 6% of New Orleans' population had died, or roughly 10% of the entire white population and more than a quarter of the so-called strangers. And for this epidemic, in fact, there was no reliable record of Black deaths, whether free or enslaved, 
This does not mean, of course, that Black people did not die from yellow fever, just that these deaths were not recorded, which was a statistical deficiency reproduced in later epidemics. And then we see basically this new pattern emerge. So 1799, there's another epidemic of yellow fever that kills almost 8% of the population. Then another epidemic broke out in 1800. And this is killing all manner of people, especially, though, again, the strangers. This is what everyone is recognizing, that strangers, these newcomers, are especially vulnerable to this disease. Whereas the Creoles, many people who claim to have been born and raised in New Orleans, they seem to show at least some more protection against this disease. In episode 174, Thomas Appel told us about yellow fever epidemics in Philadelphia. What other early American cities dealt with yellow fever epidemics in the 18th and 19th centuries? Many American cities had experienced yellow fever starting really in the 17th century. We see outbreaks in Baltimore, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, very famously in 1793, but also especially in southern cities like Charleston or Norfolk. By the 19th century, we're also seeing some epidemics largely dissipate from northern cities. They seem to be striking southern cities more and more. By the 1810s, 1820s, yellow fever becomes most associated with New Orleans. There are occasional outbreaks in Charleston and other places, but really New Orleans becomes the kind of hub of yellow fever in America. You told us earlier about the use of quarantine and street cleaning in attempts to mitigate the spread of disease. What other strategies did early American cities successfully use to reduce their chances of yellow fever epidemic? Following Philadelphia's 1793 epidemic, which killed 5,000 people and also incidentally infected many framers of the Constitution, including Alexander Hamilton, the city commissioned this engineer to build a waterworks. His name was Benjamin Henry Latrobe. Now, Latrobe was in many ways a sort of premier engineer of the early republic. He did a whole bunch of projects, including building the porticos of the White House. And his waterworks in Philadelphia massively improved the health of Philadelphia. And in fact, we only see a couple more minor or smaller outbreaks of yellow fever again in Philadelphia. Basically, it doesn't really appear in the 19th century. I guess ironically, or maybe sadly, Latrobe was commissioned to build a similar waterworks in New Orleans. And he started work on this in the 1810s, sent his son down to New Orleans to try to get work started. But his son died of yellow fever in 1817, and then he himself died of yellow fever in New Orleans in 1820. You mentioned earlier that northern early American cities saw declines in yellow fever outbreaks in the 19th century, but New Orleans actually saw an increase. Catherine, could you tell us why this was? Did early New Orleanians handle their epidemics differently from other early American cities? We're seeing in some sense in the earliest decades of the 19th century, cities increasingly taking sort of responsibility for the health of their inhabitants. So that means establishing waterworks, that means building sewers, that means installing quarantines, that means setting up hospitals and poorhouses. And we see that this pattern is much, much slower in New Orleans. And the sort of difference becomes even more stark by the mid 19th century, when New Orleans was spending many factors less, many, many factors less than almost any other city on health or poor relief, even though New Orleans was the United States deadliest city by far with triple the national mortality rate. And basically, you see politicians in New Orleans very unwilling to spend tax dollars, to spend any kind of money on infrastructure that would improve health. So again, like quarantines or like hospitals or sanitation, basically they say, you know, there's no way to stop yellow fever properly, that quarantines don't work. So therefore, any kind of money that we spend on this is just wasted money. And essentially, you know, the sort of first truth that they told people was nobody's forcing you to come to New Orleans. But if you come to New Orleans, you've got to accept the disease risk is going to be a part of your life or, you know, maybe your death, too. But, you know, there's nothing we can do to help you prevent getting yellow fever. It's our job to help you make money if you're a white person once you survive yellow fever. But there's nothing we can do to prevent that event from happening. This harshness you're describing really gets to the heart of your research. I think in order to understand why yellow fever epidemics played out the way they did in 19th century New Orleans, we first need to understand a bit more about the New Orleans that the United States inherited with the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. Catherine, what kind of racial and social order existed in early New Orleans? So New Orleans in the 18th century looked really quite a bit different than other North American cities. Both Spain and France relied on the labor of enslaved Africans. And so New Orleans from its founding in 1718 was majority Black. Over time, this created quite complicated racial and gender structure. Under French and Spanish slave law, an enslaved person can purchase their freedom. So we see not just the growth in the enslaved Black population, but also in the free Black population too. 
by the time of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, we see a very sizable and actually quite powerful population of free Black people, many of whom could claim ancestry going back many generations within Louisiana itself, many of whom were Catholic, many of whom spoke French or Spanish or English or African languages. So we see this complicated racial structure, which is a little bit different than the sort of white-black binary that existed in slave societies on the east coast of North America. So, for example, in Virginia. In 1804, New Orleans became an official territory of the United States. With this transition from French to United States power came a flood of American government officials who were new to the Gulf Coast port. What role did yellow fever play in the transition of power between the French and American governments? Not a very good one. It didn't go all that well because of yellow fever. So 1804, so this is the year after America has purchased Louisiana. The United States says, please just punch about this because control over New Orleans means control over the Mississippi. But that year, 1804, because floods of people are coming into New Orleans, the population is swelling. All the new American government bureaucrats, about half and a third of them die from yellow fever. That's a really, really large number. This is estimated by W.C.C. Claiborne, who was the territorial governor of Orleans Parish, appointed by Thomas Jefferson. And in fact, Claiborne himself, he almost died from yellow fever. He became very, very ill and he survived and he became acclimated. But his wife and his daughter died. They died on the same day that his temporary governorship was made permanent by Jefferson. Five years later, in fact, Claiborne's second wife would also die from yellow fever. So obviously not a great track record with yellow fever in that family. Many of his personal clerks died, various people in the land office died, as did the customs collector. Customs collector is a very important role in New Orleans because that's basically raising revenue. They, you know, they're controlling the flow of goods and people in and out of the port and collecting tariffs on products. Now, there were many, many, many epidemics, repeated epidemics, in fact, in the territorial period that lasted until 1812 when Louisiana became a state. So we see epidemics again in you know, 1804, 1805. 1809, 1811. And these epidemics kind of seem to catch the U.S. government off guard, I'd say. Many people in Washington had firsthand experience with yellow fever because they had contracted it in Philadelphia in 1793, but they didn't really know how bad it was going to be in New Orleans. They lamented the fact that yellow fever seemed to slow the activities of government, especially land and legal reform. So you've got this problem that people come here to fill one of these government posts they die, and then you have to replace them. And that takes a lot of time in many instances. So some offices are just, they're left unfilled for months and months and months on end. And this also means, of course, that, you know, beyond the personal tragedy of somebody dying from yellow fever, it also means that institutional knowledge cannot accrue. So you're basically having to reinvent the wheel all the time. For example, in the land office where land commissioners, they come down from the East Coast and they arrive, get their bearings. They're trying to figure out how to move all of these land titles from Spanish order to this new American order, and then they die. And nobody knows where they left their paperwork. This other big problem, too, is that judges, Jefferson is really frustrated by this, in fact, that judges don't seem to want to come to New Orleans because they're like, well, why am I going to sacrifice my life, essentially, or risk my life to come for this immensely complicated job of having to transfer French legal system, the civil code to this American standard. Why would I do that for this paltry salary of $2,000 a year where the sort of chance of me dying is going to be huge? And so you also see this other thing happen too, which is onerous, I suppose, for the territorial government, which is that people might come for a government job, but quickly transition out of that. You know, these ambitious white men, mostly, they want to purchase a plantation and they want to make much, much more money in cotton or sugar planting and slave owning. And so we see people, they build this job for a little while. They think the disease risk is too high and they say, well, I'm at least going to make some money. We see that basically the public sector just hemorrhage people to the private sector. That sounds incredibly chaotic. So if yellow fever and the risk that came with living in New Orleans was unavoidable, did Americans come up with any particular way to mitigate or manage these risks? You can see by about you know, 1810, this de facto system, I suppose, developed to manage yellow fever. So Claiborne, the governor, as well as many others, recognized that there's really nothing that they can do to stop or prevent yellow fever from breaking out. But the kind of haphazard solution was twofold. The first solution that this new American government saw was mass acclamation. So basically, it was every single person's patriotic duty. And yes, they said it was patriotic to get acclimated. So essentially to survive this disease, to fall sick with yellow fever and survive it. 
And the other way of thinking that we see develop around 1810, and this is expressly talked about in public health or prophylactic terms, was this embrace by Americans of Black slavery on a massive scale. So in the past, doctors and lay people alike argued that Black people were naturally immune to yellow fever. And so in this logic system that they built by around 1810, you see whites arguing that slavery was actually not just necessary in Louisiana, where it was hot and where there was so much work to be done, but that it was actually humanitarian because Black people could safely work in spaces and do certain kinds of labor that would otherwise kill white people. And so you see this two-pronged solution or non-solution, I should say, that Americans had sort of developed by statehood in 1812, which was acclamation en masse, but also this embrace of Black slavery justified on yellow fever terms. Would you tell us about the idea that you use in your research called amino capital? Acclamation, as it was understood in the 19th century, was the process of surviving yellow fever. Now, amino capital, as I see it, was accrued on individuals when this immunity was socially accepted by others. As we've talked about, New Orleans was different than other American cities. So it had this tripartite social and racial system of white people, free people of color, and enslaved people. But on the other hand, there's sort of another structure that develops alongside this, especially as epidemics increased in frequency and ferocity in the six decades before the Civil War. This city also became stratified between white people who possessed immunity to yellow fever, so the so-called acclimated, those people who remained vulnerable to the virus, the unacclimated, as it was called at the time, and those people whose immunity status could only socially and economically benefit other people, that is, black slaves and most free people of color. These labels, whether you were acclimated or unacclimated, really, really matter. Because on which side of this immunity divide a person landed measurably impacted their lives and prospects. A white person, I think it's fair to say, was virtually required to survive yellow fever to enter the elite. Once acclimated, the city's Creole and American merchants, planters, and enslavers literally embraced epidemic yellow fever as a blessing and not a curse because they found that it could essentially solve any number of other political, financial, and social problems that would otherwise have burdened the kind of profits and hegemony that they wanted. People in the past literally conceived of their acclamation as a form of capital. For example, if you were you know, a 20-year-old white man from New Jersey coming to New Orleans and you were applying for a job, one of the first qualities about yourself that you emphasized in interviews or in newspaper advertisements or on your CV, was essentially that you were acclimated. You would claim this even if you knew you weren't, because you otherwise, you know, you couldn't even get a foot in the door. People really understood that they had to leverage their immunity if they wanted professional but also social acceptance, because unacclimated people, they could not live in certain places, they could not purchase life insurance, they often could not go into business partnerships with other people, they often could not get bank loans, they could not marry in certain social circles. You see this actually with some regularity where Creole fathers and acclimated fathers of young women will not let them even socialize, in fact, with unacclimated men because there's a very high chance that he could die. And so best not to get too attached. And you see also men interviewing potential wives for their acclimation status, where they're asking, you know, have you ever had yellow fever? Are you sure about that? Did you have a doctor check that you had yellow fever? What were your symptoms exactly? Are you absolutely positive that you're acclimated? And so, you know, facing all these impediments, of course, where, you know, you can't live in certain places, can't work in certain jobs, it's kind of no wonder, I guess, that you see a lot of people actively seeking to get sick, deciding that the disease risk was worth it, because otherwise, you're kind of trapped in this professional social purgatory at length. And so really, you know, the choice is fleeing the city, kind of giving up, or getting sick. Many people chose the latter route. And one more thing on this, and I think we've seen this a lot with COVID-19, in fact, too, that Antebellum New Orleanians were very good at convincing themselves that they would be fine, even though they knew that the odds were really grim, that many people died from this disease. But you see, especially, I would say, young men routinely touting these aspirational mantras about human agency over disease, how they would survive, though their brother died, though you know their friend died, that they were young and healthy, and that they would survive this disease. It seems that being able to prove that one had had yellow fever was incredibly important to succeed in early New Orleans. But during a time in which no blood tests existed to check for antibodies, how did a person actually prove they were immune to the disease? Later in the 19th century, there were immunity certificates that were printed by the federal government. And they were mostly given to sailors and people in the merchant marine who were seeking to work in tropical locations. 
And this would basically give you passage to different port cities in South America, Africa, and the Caribbean. Earlier on, you should actually see this with some regularity in life insurance applications, where if you're from the Deep South, you have to get affidavits of witnesses to your illness, often from doctors, sort of signed and guaranteed, certified that you have survived this disease. And you see these often attached to life insurance applications. But there was no physical passport. People have these vaccine cards these days. There was nothing like that. So instead of having this kind of official documentation, instead you perform it. And the way you perform this is that, you know, you go to a job interview, you talk about the various stages of your illness. Sometimes your employer will talk to your doctor or talk to people that knew you when you were sick, just to make sure that those symptoms were really yellow fever symptoms and not something else. You'll go to a bar or a coffee shop and you'll talk loudly about your brush with yellow fever back in 1817 or back in 1833. And it becomes sort of social knowledge more than a sort of verified fact. But, you know, a person could never be entirely sure of their immunity because, again, it's invisible. But if you lived through multiple summers in New Orleans, if you've lived through multiple epidemics, people generally give you the benefit of the doubt over time. And as you see this with almost everyone in the elite merchant planting circles in New Orleans, where they have a sort of genesis story that they've created about their acclimation. Many of them, you know, will write stories about it and publish them in newspapers. But it really becomes sort of socially recognized over time. The greatest proof was not any kind of official documentation, but the fact that you just had survived long enough and lived through multiple epidemics. In your forthcoming book, Necropolis, you argue that officials in early New Orleans actually weaponized yellow fever. How did they weaponize yellow fever and who benefited and who suffered from this stance? So this is really the real crux question of my book, which was how did yellow fever essentially harden the racial and social order of New Orleans? You know, make mortality higher, make it more brutal, make it more violent. This is sort of a brief overview of how the elites weaponized yellow fever. So it's this essentially that yellow fever came to be seen as a disease in New Orleans without any kind of fix. So this is increasingly out of step with other American cities that are investing in quarantine, in drainage, in hospitals, in poor relief, essentially taking on the idea that disease is something that humans can fix or at least improve. Elites in New Orleans took the opposite approach. They basically said that yellow fever could not be cured. There was nothing that could be done to stop outbreaks from happening. Therefore, everyone's got to live with it. So the city is utterly filthy. And a part of this problem is that also by the 1830s and 40s, you have tens and tens of thousands of European immigrants fleeing famine and political upheaval in Europe, arriving from mostly Ireland and Germany. And they're arriving in New Orleans. They're, you know, incredibly poor. And then they're basically treated as disposable laborers because city officials don't care if they live or die fundamentally. They actually expect most of them to die. And so this basically gives them the kind of carte blanche to not invest in infrastructure And it legitimated mass death and suffering as a sort of transaction cost of building the cotton kingdom. The other cruelest of tricks in the system of immunocapitalism is that Black people could possess immunity, but not immunocapital, because any benefits, besides surviving this disease long term, of course, any kind of social or economic benefit came with their acclimation, that came with them surviving this disease, basically devolved onto their white owners. For example, when Solomon Northrup, he was a free black man who was kidnapped from upstate New York, and he was the author, by the way, of 12 Years a Slave. Solomon Northrup was brought to New Orleans and sold to a plantation on the Red River in Louisiana. He became sick with yellow fever around his second or third summer. He was very, very close to death. A doctor was only called for at the very end of his illness, and he was forced basically to go back to work when he was still convalescent. He was very lucky to survive. Now, the sort of cruelest thing about this, though, this labor of surviving this disease, this created value for Epps, the man who enslaved him. Would you tell us a bit more about how enslavers manipulated the idea of amino capital to their benefit? In the slave market, acclimation had very clear value. And in fact, enslavers would pay between 25 and even 50 percent more for a guaranteed acclimated slave. So slave traders essentially created these fictitious backstories of acclimation where They would tell a person who had been forced to march from Virginia, from the Upper South, in the domestic slave trade who'd been brought to New Orleans, they would tell them to give this lie about their acclimation status. And they would tell them, you know, these are the symptoms that you should recount if asked, say that you use this doctor, say that you've been in this state for a certain number of years. And of course, enslavers who are buying people in the market too, they ask these questions. So they'll ask questions about people's health history. And chief among them, of course, is yellow fever, where they will ask, how long have you been in the state for? 
Have you ever had yellow fever? Are you sure it was yellow fever? Some kind of almost insurance upon the value they're investing. The sort of cruel twist in the system, of course, is that enslaved people who were as scared of yellow fever as anybody else petrified of this disease. It was, in fact, it was one of the most fearsome elements of coming to the Deep South beyond being forcibly separated from family and friends and from everything you know. And this is, you know, the domestic slave trade is this horrible institution. But one of the things that people feared the most about coming to Louisiana was its diseases. Catherine, how does studying the early American history of epidemics and perceptions of immunity help us better understand not only the history of early New Orleans, but the history of early America more generally? So this contributes a lot, I think, to our understanding of early America. It really helps us understand just how quickly and violently the cotton kingdom arose. In understanding yellow fever and people's reaction to it, you can understand this explosion in racial slavery and also the ascendant pro-slavery attitudes that came to defend slavery, but also in general, the sort of status quo of the South on the eve of secession in 1860. I think you can also understand a lot about the history of race and medicine and also the, the malleability of disease and how disease was used to essentially create more inequality in already unequal societies. We often talk about disease and even in the early republic as you know epidemics being kind of great levelers where epidemics come, many people die, but in the aftermath, people are, are unified around common ends. They sort of renew their faith in God. They renew their faith in their community. They help each other when they're sick. I think we see the absolute opposite of that in New Orleans here. We're seeing disease be, you know, not just weaponized, but really deeply used by elites to create more inequality, which will expand their own personal capital, but also catalyze the rapid ascent of the cotton and sugar kingdoms, all powered, of course, through slavery. So I think you can see disease not being some kind of great social leveler here. We're seeing it actually be a great unequalizer. And that really helps us understand how disease was, you know, it wasn't just that it happened or that, you know, epidemics don't have the sort of start and end point, but they're used and they're made into narratives and they're made sort of justified and people develop explanations for them, which will increase social and racial inequality. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. In your opinion, had a procedure like inoculation or vaccination been available for yellow fever, how might the power structure of early New Orleans have been different? Well, I think certainly if inoculation had been available or vaccination had been available, a lot fewer people would have died. Hundreds of thousands of people died from yellow fever during the 19th century in the Deep South. Those lives could have been saved. It's a really interesting question because, you know, what did yellow fever do to contribute to the dynamics of this slave society? How would the power structure have been different had yellow fever not been here? You know, if you take yellow fever out of the equation, would the same thing have happened? I don't think so. I really don't think so. I think yellow fever was a crucial ingredient in the ways that people built society and thought about self-making and thought about structures and risk and value in general. If you live in a place where basically half of the people that you meet, you know, will die from this disease, that, of course, would have an impact on the way that you think about your own life the way that you think about the disposability of other people's lives, especially Black lives in the antebellum South. I think that yellow fever essentially turned up the volume on so many of the aspects of the society. I think that essentially yellow fever made white people more inert to violence, more comfortable with mass death and mortality, more comfortable with seeing inequality on a massive scale, and made people more comfortable with this very small state approach to society in which Really, the state doesn't play much of a role in people's lives. It's the market. The market is reigned supreme above all, not the state itself. Would you tell us what aspect of history you are researching and writing about now? I'm working on a project about life insurance premiums, especially climate premiums in the United States, but also in Europe and in Africa. So this spans from the 19th to the 20th century. I'm working on a project about sort of mapping slave revolts and trying to understand how rumors about slave revolts spread across physical spaces in the American South. And I have a sort of larger project about medicine and immigration that I'm working on, too. But that's really nebulous at this stage. So 
I won't go into much detail about that, but you know, really how perceptions of health shaped immigration patterns to the United States in the 19th and 20th centuries. Where is the best place to look for more information about you, your work, and how to get in contact with you? Well, you can follow me on Twitter or please email me at the address on my faculty page at Stanford. I would be delighted to hear from you anytime. Thank you so much for joining us on Ben Franklin's World today, Catherine. Thank you. It was delightful to be here. Living in early New Orleans meant living with yellow fever. With a mortality rate of 50%, the constant possibility of one's death weighed heavy on most minds. This also meant that those who successfully made it through yellow fever became people of note. Their perceived immunity privileged them in New Orleanian society, promising access to jobs, marriage, and opportunities that cannot be risked on an unacclimated person. As Catherine revealed to us, early New Orleanians manipulated ideas about perceived immunity to yellow fever. Early New Orleanians privileged elite white Americans while simultaneously creating additional hardships and increased exploitation of enslaved, free Black, and lower-class immigrant workers. As Catherine reminds us, disease is not something that just happens. In New Orleans, in particular, yellow fever epidemics were strategically used to create a narrative that increased social and racial inequality of this early American city. If you'd like more information about Catherine, her forthcoming book, Necropolis, plus notes and links for everything we talked about today, visit the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 316. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So while you're gathered around the dinner table this weekend, please tell your friends and family about Ben Franklin's World. This episode of Ben Franklin's World is supported by an American Rescue Plan grant to the Omohundro Institute from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omohundro Institute's digital audio team, Joseph Edelman, Jessica Brabble, Martha Howard, and Holly White. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, happy Thanksgiving. Please know that the team and I are really grateful for you and all your support. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute and is sponsored by the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation.